Are you ready to hear the word? Revelation 19, read just one verse. Oh, let's read the first seven verses. Start verse 1. And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants in her hand. And again they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down to worship God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. This is the verse I want you to focus on. Let us be glad and rejoice, and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and... His wife hath made herself, what? Ready. Simply tonight, are you ready? Are you ready? His wife, the bride, hath made herself ready. Holy Spirit, I stand before you in need of your touch. I can't preach without you, Holy Ghost. My voice would fall straight in front of me, right to the floor. It would not pierce, it would not penetrate, it would have no meaning. And I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, to come now to cleanse me, sanctify me, give me a clear voice, clean hands, pure heart. Let the word come forth of purity. Let it come forth straight to the heart. Lord, don't let anybody leave here tonight without having been moved and challenged and changed. Lord, do something deep in our hearts. This is a simple, very simple message, but oh God, Smite us with it, we pray, in love. Touch me, Lord, please. In Jesus' name, amen. I had planned to speak to sinners tonight, and I had uh, the message quite well on its way. But yesterday in prayer, the Holy Spirit came on me and, and, and said, David, my people aren't ready. They're not ready. And over and over again, I felt some of the pain and the grief of the Lord's heart, he kept saying, David, my people are not ready. And I said, Lord, what do you mean, not ready? Your people not ready. Not ready for what? First of all, we are not ready for the awful judgments that are about to fall on this land. We are not ready. When those in Yugoslavia, what was former Yugoslavia, they had no idea that those quaint little towns one day would be bombed to pieces. Friday night, we had a film, a, a, a presentation here, a slide presentation from our missions group who have just returned from Bosnia and Herzegovina and, and showed the bombed out cities and the towns. Those people were never ready. They thought those little tourist towns that had, had stood for centuries would never be touched. The people would never be uprooted from their homes and suddenly the bombs were falling and, and there was a blast everywhere and the whole nation in turmoil People lost their homes. In fact, we're helping support a ministry there. Uh, in fact, we, we, we're trying to get deeply involved in helping the uh, men and women that are coming out uh, of those uh, countries, out of Bosnia especially, who have lost everything. We heard the testimony of one young lady who lost everything but her bicycle. And she rode out and she said, they can't take from me what I have in my heart. They couldn't take Jesus from her. But we are not ready. We're not ready for the calamities that are coming. Now, there are, I'm not talking about getting prepared the way many of the extremists are preparing today for what is coming. They see a Holocaust coming. They call them right wingers. They call them extremists. But all the mountains and hills of, of, of Kentucky, West Virginia, especially Colorado and into Wyoming, and some of the mountainous areas that are not very well populated here in the United States, Every piece of land is being bought up. Every little log cabin. And people are taking trailers out there and going out into the woods. They have a stash of guns. They have a year or two supply of ammunition. Five, ten year supply of food. And they're digging in because they believe that hard times are coming and they've got to get ready. And there's a preparation going on 
There are newsletters going all over the nation. Get prepared. Get ready. There'll be riots in the cities. People are going to flee. Now, folks, I've had, I've had visions of what it's going to be like. And I'm not trying to scare anybody. In fact, for, for a while, I said, uh, uh, a few years ago, I said, God, uh, people not listening to any of my prophecies anymore. People are not really being moved by them. Uh, people just don't want to hear it anymore. And you know, it's not, it's not fun coming to a congregation bringing bad news. I'd rather get up and bless everybody. You know, it's not, it, uh, I stood in this congregation a few years ago and warned of explosions coming. Some of you were in that meeting. You remember that. Four months ago, or five months ago, I sent out a newsletter, and if you're on my mailing list, you read, there were five things I saw coming, and number three was a huge explosion that was going to take away the security of the land. It was sent out to almost 700,000 people, and I got weary of prophesying because people weren't listening, people weren't hearing. And I don't like that kind of, uh, of, a, of a thing to have to do, but I'm telling you now, folks, I've seen some of the visions of what's going to happen, especially here in New York City, when these riots begin to happen, I have seen, I've seen every highway in New Jersey and upper state New York filled with people, people sleeping in their cars out in the open fields, grabbing whatever food they can and going out trying to find a little place of security outside of this city. You know I've been prophesying over a thousand fires will be burning in this city. And folks, I believe that's just a statement of fact that there'll be many. It could be two, three, five thousand. There are at least a thousand fires burning. I've seen that time and time again when I stand on the 30th floor apartment and I look out over the city. I see it burning in New Jersey. I see it in Newark. I see it all over New Jersey, Long Island, everywhere. Riots. Fires burning. And I'm not talking about the preparation, the physical preparation that so many are making. What kind of preparation can you make here in New York City? What are you going to do? Uh, you don't even have enough room for your clothes now in your closet. Where are you going to store food? <laughs> Some of you have to squeeze in to sleep into your apartment. How many locks do you have on your door? Let's see. I've got, I've, I was figuring it out. We've got the chain lock. I've got three dead bolts. And the biggest angel you ever saw right outside my door. <laughs> Hallelujah. The angel of the Lord encamped around about them that fear him. You and I can't stockpile food. I don't have a gun. And I'm not about to blow a gun because I'd probably blow my hand off. And I don't think you need a gun if you have the angels of the Lord camping around about you. I, I hear Christians all over the country, they're, they're loading up with guns and ammunition. I, I have a feeling angels say, well, you don't need me. Take care. Now, I'm not putting down people who prepare. These people that are, are, are writing these newsletters, they say get as many gold coins, get, get thousands of dollars, gold coin and silver. And, and, and uh, folks, I was into that a number of years ago, about 20 years ago. I got into that so deep and we had a ranch in Texas and, and uh, I, I, was, I was preparing for the tribulation. I, re I was preparing. I thought America was dead and gone. And so I bought 50 head of cattle, black Angus cattle. We had 200 acres, and I had a full-time bulldozer, and I, we bulldozed at like seven, eight lakes and stocked it with fish. I was going to ride out any storm that ever came to America. I was going to ride it out. Looking back, I got to thinking how stupid it is that, that I, I was going to take care of myself, my family, and our little group and let, let the rest of the world figure out where they're going to go, what to do. But the Black Angus got Bang's disease and had to sell them all. Fish died. Big garden. You know what it cost when you figured out? You know how much it cost us to grow just one dozen ear of corn? Eight dollars. 
By the time you figured up all your equipment, all the fertilizer, and everything else, all this garden and all this stuff that we were going to do, I had compost piles. We had everything. We were going to ride out the judgment. Ended up giving the place away mostly. What shall profit a man if he gains the whole world? Talking about security. And loses his own soul. Because he's made all the physical preparations. And he's made no preparation from his heart. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. You get your heart ready for the coming of Jesus. You're ready for anything that comes to New York City. You're ready for riots. You're ready for anything. You don't have to have bullets. You don't have to have guns. You don't have to anything but the angel of the Lord. But if your heart is right with God, you're making the proper preparation. You don't have to have stockpiles of food. You don't have to worry about gold and silver. My Bible said when the riots and the judgment comes, they're going to throw the gold in the streets. And it's going to be absolutely worthless. A cow would be worth more than a hundred million dollars worth of gold. One cow. No, I'm talking about heart preparation. Let's talk about heart readiness. A readiness for the loss of all things. Now, folks, there was a generation that lost everything. And Paul the Apostle said, you took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. Now, it can come to that. I, I don't believe that I can stand as a pastor here and tell you everything's going to be all right, that when judgment comes to New York City, you're going to escape it, and I'm going to escape it. I don't believe that for a minute. That's what happened in China. There were missionaries who, who kept saying, well, the communists are coming, but not one of you are going to die. You're not going to suffer. You're going to go right through it. And then when many of them were killed, there was bloodshed, many suffering. They lost everything. They were not ready. They got angry at the missionaries, and they turned many against Christ because they said we were not warned. No, there, there's going to be a lot of suffering, but the Lord said he's going to see us through. And, 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 and folks, the, Paul the Apostle said, you took joyfully the spoiling of goods. They lost everything, every, every bit of their goods, their houses, their lands, and everything. It was lost. Do you have something in you tonight? Are you prepared to lose everything you have? Lose everything you have and still cling to Jesus with all your heart? That's what it may come to. Hallelujah. That's why it's important to cling to Jesus. Now, I want to focus on getting ready to meet the Lord as a bride. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Remember the story in Matthew 25 of the ten virgins? Five were wise and five were foolish. And the five wise had oil in their lamps. Their lamps were trimmed and burning, and they had a supply of oil. Now, the five foolish virgins were not prepared, the Bible said. In fact, it's very clear, the Scripture says, while they went to buy oil, remember the five foolish virgins, when they heard it, said, the bridegroom come to go out to meet him. Now, what it means by having a trimmed lamp is a burning lamp. That's all it means. It means to be on fire. It means to have it be inflamed. There's a fire burning. And five of them had a fire burning in their heart. The word came. The word was the bridegroom cometh. They had the word in their heart, and the word was a flame in their spirits. Now, the other five had the capacity to learn. They had the capacity of the others, but they didn't have a burning word in their heart. There was nothing burning. There was no fire. There was no flame inside. Now, I want to talk about this with you. What is the lamp? The Bible says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet. And a light unto my path. Now you have a lamp. That's this living word of God. You have a lamp. The scripture, Isaiah talks about that word in Zion that burneth as a lamp. The word of righteousness in Zion. Isaiah 62, 1. The prophet said the word of God should be as the burning of a lamp. Your lamp should be on fire. His word, Jeremiah said, was in my heart as a burning fire shot up in my bones. Every time Jeremiah got tired of prophesying or tired of, of the rejection of his message, he'd say, God, that's enough. I don't want any more. But there was a fire burning, and God, could, he couldn't stop the fire burning in his bones. Folks, I couldn't stop preaching if I tried. There's a fire in my bones. When I was a little boy, when I was eight years, nine years old, I was out with my Bible. I, I preached to dogs, I cats, anybody. There was a fire burning in my heart. 
when the Lord put that book on my heart, set the trumpet to your mouth. My wife here tonight can testify. We, we would be out side on, on the, I remember one night out in front of the uh, house on the patio and we had some visitors sitting there and all of a sudden I got up and started prophesying to the woods and the trees. At the top of my voice, the spirit came on me and I fell on the ground prophesying to the, to the woods. I wouldn't even look at them. I prophesied to the woods because there's a fire burning in my bones. That should be in all of us. The word that you receive should be on fire. The word you receive should be inflamed in you so that it's not forgotten that it works the work of the Holy Ghost in you. Now, if Bible statistics mean what I believe they do, half of God's people are not going to be ready to go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Because the Bible says, and while they went to buy oil, the bridegroom came, and they that were, what? Ready. They that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Fifty percent of them were missed. Fifty percent had the door locked in their face. The foolish had all the capacity, same capacity, all the ability, every bit of capacity that the wise virgins had. You know, I grieve over certain Christians that are still in this church and some that have left this church. And I grieve over them. And I'll tell you why. I have stood in this pulpit for almost eight years. I have bled spiritually. I have never stopped giving the full counsel of God to this church. This church was birthed in my bosom, the bosom of the Holy Ghost, and God brought me to these streets ten years ago. I walked with Jim Symbol, a pastor of Brooklyn Tabernacle, up and down 14th Street. We looked at a theater near 14th Street two years before we even came here, weeping and crying, praying, seeking the face of God for two years. And then I remember coming into this city for street rallies. And I tell you folks, I, I, I stood before a devil almost face to face because I went up and down these streets weeping. My wife was staying in, in a, a hotel right over here. <clears throat> and uh, I would get up at midnight and I would walk down Times Square and I would pour my heart out to God. And I knew what it was to have a turban, turban man stand right next to me. He doesn't know me. And he says, get out of this city. You don't belong here. And it was the devil himself speaking. I knew what it was to walk up 8th Avenue over here. A woman pushing a baby cart and someone trying to steal the baby. And the cart turns over and I try to rescue the baby. The mother turns on me, demon possessed, and says, you get out of this city. Don't you touch anything in this city. You don't belong here. Get out of this city. Curse me. I had saved her baby. The devil himself, time after time, saying, get out of this city. But there was a fire. God birthed something in my heart in this church. I was alone. There was no other preacher with me. There was nobody with me but the angel of the Lord. And he said, I'm going to raise up in this city a church. I'm going to raise up people who are going to move on with God. I'm going to raise up a holy remnant people. And you go, David, if it costs your life, you go. And you be a shepherd to those people. And I have not once ever, I'm going to tell you now to your face, everybody in this building, there's never been a time I've been in this pulpit that I haven't received a word from heaven directly, where I have been on my knees. I don't get it from books. I get alone with God like I've done all week, and I hear from heaven, and I bring you the heart of God. Nothing else. I have delivered you the heart of God. I have not fled from this pulpit. I have not abandoned my position. I have been here. I've been faithful to this church, and I have preached the whole counsel of God. But here's what grieves me. Some of you have heard enough gospel. You have heard enough truth. You have been warned. You have been warned with holy thunder. You have been warned with righteousness. The pastors that stand in this church are righteous men. I stand before God as an open book. I stand before God as an open book. And I want to tell you, God has raised up a voice out of this church that's gone around the world. Absolutely gone around the world. 
And the devil will do everything in his power to shut that voice down. He's after the voice. The devil's a headhunter, just as he was after John the Baptist. The devil's not satisfied. said, give me Herodias. Herodias says, give me his head on a platter. And the devil goes after the head of every man of God that preaches the truth in righteousness and holiness. He said, I want your head. There's been a price on his head. There's been a price on my head. There's a price on any man of God who prophesies and preaches righteousness. There's a price on his head right out of hell. But what grieves me is that some have heard so much gospel, been so warned, and yet they're so quickly, absolutely blown away. They're blown away by winds and waves of doctrine. They're blown away by gossip. They're blown away by slander. And they don't stand. I, I say, did not any of the word get into the spirit? Did the word not come to life? Do you know why? God calls godly pastors who are not afraid. I don't fear any man. If I'm in righteousness, if you do that which is right, the Bible says, who can harm you? Who can harm you? But listen listen to me. I want you to go to Hebrews, and I'm going to show you something that absolutely staggers me. It just staggers me. Hebrews, fifth chapter. Now, I'm going to tell you, Holy Ghost is going to speak now. He is going to speak to your heart. Folks, look at me. Before you go any further. I'm talking to you as a pastor. Who's called to give his life for the sheep. To lay down his life. I'm not boasting. I'm telling you what I know in my heart from God, the Holy Ghost. But I want you to hear something. Let me talk to you as pastor. I'm not mad at anybody. I've got the anointing on me. Hebrews 5, verse 11. Of whom we have many things to say. This is Hebrews. Fifth chapter, 11th verse. Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. You're slow of hearing. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Now look at me. If you have been sitting here for at least two years, if it's more, it's even a bigger burden on you. But if you've been in this church for more than two years and you have been listening to the word of God, Paul the apostle says, up to this time, with all the gospel you've heard, you ought to be a teacher. I'm not talking about being in a classroom. I'm not talking about being a Sunday school teacher. I'm talking about being a teacher to those around you. The aged women are supposed to teach the younger women to be sober-minded and to be submissive to their husbands and to walk in righteousness. They're to be teaching them. And the men are supposed to be teaching the younger men. Everybody that has been sitting under the gospel said, you've heard enough now. If you have really listened to it, if it hasn't gone in one ear and out the other, if you've been just a hearer and not a doer, that's something else. But if you've been a hearer and you want to be a doer, And if you've been asking the Holy Ghost to make the word alive in your heart, you ought to be a teacher. Why are you being tossed and turned by gossip and slander? Why aren't you teaching those people from the book of Proverbs what the Bible says? Why aren't you teaching them? Why aren't you shutting the mouth of gossipers and slanders all around you? Why aren't you stopping winds and waves of doctrine, false doctrine and error? You ought to be a teacher. You should be teaching. There ought to be hundreds of teachers here. He said, why, after all this time, why aren't you a teacher? You're still a baby with a bottle in your mouth. You're a baby. Can you imagine a twelve, a, a seven-year-old boy walking around with a bottle? He said, you... You shouldn't be a baby. You know who the babies are? The babies have to have it spoon fed. They have to have just milk. They want just simple little message. They don't want to be reproved. They don't want to be challenged. They want that simple little message and they don't want any responsibility. They want to just come and praise and worship the Lord. They don't want to get involved. The Bible says you should be a teacher by now.
The word says, a wicked doer giveth heed to false lips, and a liar gives ear to a gossiping tongue. Proverbs 17, 4. Now, folks, is that true or is it not? Is that God's word? You're getting quiet on me here. Now, why isn't it? Why doesn't that work? Why, why don't you go into the book of Proverbs? Why doesn't every Christian go into the book of Proverbs and underline every verse that you can? Every verse that you can. Underline it. And start teaching it. I, I was sitting at a table recently. And there were two ministers. <clears throat> One on each side of me. We're just talking. And suddenly, they, one looked across me to the other minister and said, did you hear about brother so-and-so? He's appointed certain position he's appointed. The other minister said, oh, no. He's a phony. He's a cheat. And the other said, yeah, I know. Can you imagine being appointed in a position like that? The guy that never had an honest bone in his body. And I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there listening to this. And I said, these are ministers. Ministers are the biggest gossipers in the world. I was a part of that until the Lord saved me out of it and convicted me. I've had, you know, I've had to call. I've, I've called over 15 people that God brought to my mind that over the past 12, 15 years, I, I had said something or hurt them and I had to go and apologize. And I repented before God. And every one of them been healed with me. But since God taught me that, I, I'm very conscious whenever I hear it now. And, and I suddenly, one of the ministers saw my reaction. I was getting up to leave because I don't want to hear that. I, I have no part of it. I was walking away. And I noticed this one minister stopped, younger minister. So I took this minister aside. I said, because I see something in you, I want to show you what you did. You just slandered a pastor. You slandered a man. You said something about that. I had no need to know. I don't want to know anything about it. And God won't allow me to listen to it. I don't want to hear it. And I'm sorry for you. And I said, if you don't deal with this, it's going to destroy your ministry. It's going to destroy you. And this young minister said, thank you so much. I was convicted right in front of your presence. I was so convicted. And folks, if there, why, why is it? Why is it? Do you think for one moment that people who sit around in restaurants and talk, People who sit around in their homes and get on the telephone. You think you're going to be ready when Jesus comes? When they're gossiping? And you think you're going to be ready for Jesus comes? The Bible says, Paul the Apostle said, that strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. If you are established in the word of God, if you believe what's been preached from this pulpit, you've got to have discernment. If the word of God is a frame in you, in other words, I can stand in front of you, I'll quote scripture to you, I'll show it to you from Proverbs, I'll show it to you from Psalms, I'll show it to you in the word of God, and you'll just come right back as if I hadn't said a word. Because it's not on fire, you really don't believe it. If the word of God is a flame and burning in your heart, you can stand and not be shaken by any wind or wave of dark. Nobody can move you. <laughs> Hallelujah. The Bible says a tell-bearer reveals secrets, but a faithful spirit covers the matter. A hypocrite with his mouth destroys his brother. Colossians 3.16 let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. Folks, if you're going to get together with anybody and you're going to talk, here's what the scripture says you to do. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, all wisdom, teaching, admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts. Oh, folks, Martin Luther King made a statement, I have a dream. Folks, I've got a dream also. I have a dream of a church, of a people who are so Bible literate. They are so into the word of God. They have searched this book. They have it marked. And the word is alive because this is the mirror. They've searched their hearts through the word of God. 
Folks, if, if you don't have the book of Proverbs, mark every page, you don't know the Bible at all. You ought to be into the book of Proverbs. And I'm telling you now, if you go home in the next two weeks and just totally master the book of Proverbs, it'll change your life. It'll change your life. I have a dream of a church where people rise up and they become teachers. They don't go around putting people down. They don't go around condemning people. But anybody tries to put poison in their system, anybody tries to destroy the church of Jesus Christ, they get the word of God. Say, brother, sister, let me tell you what the word says. Let me take you to the book and sit and teach, teach, teach. I would like, I'm going to stop. I want to stop for just a minute. I would like to know in the balcony here in the main floor, how many have been attending this church regularly for at least two years? Will you stand, please? At least two years. About a third of this congregation. Remain standing, please. I'm going to do what the Holy Ghost... I, I slipped away from up on platform, went back to the room to pray. The Holy Spirit told me to do this. I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask God to bring you out of the closet. You're going to come out, and you're going to take your role as a teacher. Keep standing. I'm going to ask God to anoint you right now. I want everybody that's standing to make yourself a promise. You don't have to promise me or God. Make yourself a promise that you'll go into the Psalms and you'll go into Proverbs and you will get your pencil and you will mark and you will study that with everything in your heart so that the Word of God and ask the Holy Ghost to make it fire in your bones. Make it fire in your bones. And I'm going to ask God to bring you out to take your responsibility as a teacher. I dream of a church where people are so ingrained in the Word of God that nothing comes against that church can bother it or hurt it because it's so strong in the Word of God. And I want you to take your role your calling as a teacher. You have need. He, Paul said, after all this time, you should be teachers. You ought to be a teacher. I'm going to ask God by His Spirit to make you a teacher. So that you, you don't go around condemning people, but you go around anybody. Anybody wants to talk. Anybody wants to say anything about any brother, any sister, any ministry. Not just this ministry, any ministry. If it's slandered on your job against your boss, don't get involved with it. Be a teacher, even to those who don't know Jesus. Teach them. Say, well, my Bible says, and start memorizing some of these verses. Mark them and have it ingrained in you. I'm going to pray for you right now. I'm going to pray for you. Come on, look at this choir. Look here. Amen. I'm going to have a bunch of teachers behind this. Teachers. Hallelujah. How many are willing to take this on? If you are, raise both hands while I pray. I'm going to stop my message and I'm going to pray right now. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit. You said you ought to be teachers by now. I'm asking you to send the Holy Ghost upon everyone that has a pure heart. Everyone who loves you with everything in them. God, sanctify them. Purge them. If there's any poison in anybody's system, take it out. And Lord, I pray you raise up teachers who are into the Word of God. They're not, they're not just preaching for pastors. They're not teaching for pastors. They're not trying to protect anybody. They're protecting the name of Jesus Christ and the Word of the living God. Lord, I pray you anoint them. God, anoint teachers to teach their families, husbands, wives, teaching one another. Saying, here's what the Bible says. Here's what the Word says. Here's what the truth is. God, you shall know the truth. It says, and the truth shall set you free. Hallelujah. Give us this church, O oh God, that you will raise up teachers who will stand firm, unmovable, unmovable in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let all teachers be seated. <laughs> Paul said, though we, speaking of preachers or ministers, though ministers or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel, let him be accursed. If an angel called a special meeting in this city, somebody came to you and said, you, you go hear this angel. And he preaches another gospel. This is not according to the heart of Christ. The Bible says, let him be accursed. Because you see, those who are established in the word of God are unmovable. They are strong. They are teachers, 
and they have this ability to stand strong, firm, because nothing can shake them. When you're on the rock, the Word of God, you can't be moved. You cannot be moved. And Paul makes it clear that if preachers or angels try to move you away from that truth that you read and observe and becomes a flame in your soul, leave it alone. Hallelujah. You want to be ready? Well, he needs, when he comes, he should find you teaching. What have you been doing? Have you been teaching people? Have you been teaching others? How to walk, how to live, how to honor those, do honor is given to those who are in authority. Do you do that? The Bible also said the bride hath made herself, herself ready. And I, this is the second point. First of all, th- this bride has, laid, th- this bride has the lamp burning and bright. She marching in with the lamp burning and bright. That means her heart is a flame. The word of God's a flame. Folks, when, when you hear a message like this, you ought to write the verses down or get the tape and then go look at, uh, refer to the scriptures and replay it and go back and, and say, Lord, I'm going to keep reading that verse until it's on fire. And you have to ask the Holy Ghost. You have to plead with the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost, it's a dead letter unless you come and bring it life. It, it brings death. It has to bring life. Holy Ghost, make the word alive to my heart. Hallelujah. Give me another five minutes. This bride got ready, first of all, by setting her lamp ablaze. The word of God alive in her heart. And she's she's worthy now. She's taught all of her sisters. She's taught others. And now, I believe also she was heart, she was daily in heart searching. I believe that she made herself ready by searching for anything that would be a spot or wrinkle and saying, God, I want, I want everything unlike my bridegroom. I want everything unlike Jesus out of my life. I want it out. I, I want God to search everything. You know, you can have so much, uh, zeal. You can have so much experience with God and still have a place that, that it's under, uh, blindness. It's under darkness and you need the searchlight of the Holy Ghost. For the Lord searcheth all hearts, and he understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. Another verse. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deepest things of God. Jesus himself said, I am he that searcheth the reins and the hearts. I search you out. Folks, when I, I see the way some Christians are going... After sitting, even when I see some ministers where they go after all they've preached, there's something that cries inside, oh God, are these, are they searching themselves? Are they getting alone with God? Are they saying, oh God, am I saying anything, doing anything that's going to grieve you? Am I doing anything? Folks, I do that every day. I do that every day. I did it between services. I went home. Laid myself out and wept before the Lord and said, Oh God, if there's anything in my heart, search me, turn it on. I'll obey you. Just show me. Show me anything that's unlike you. Anything I say, anything I do, it's unlike Jesus. Let me see it. Let me know it. Expose it. This, this bride made herself ready because there, when she came in to the marriage supper of the Lamb, she was so prepared for this man. She knew his likes and dislikes. She had prepared herself. She was without spot or wrinkle, the Bible says. She dealt with everything in her life that could mar her relationship with her husband-to-be. And oh, folks, I believe this with all my heart. If you're here this this evening and you want the Holy Ghost to search you, he'll do that. He will search you. He's not in hiding. He's faithful. And he, he will not beat you over the head. He doesn't come with a hammer. He doesn't come to beat you down. The Holy Ghost is gentle. He's a comforter. And when he shows you these things, he does it only to heal you, only to save you, only to make you a better teacher of his word. The Holy Ghost is faithful. If you will get along with God, quit consulting with people. Don't go to men. Don't go to them. Go on your face. Folks, I would never, I would never, ever be concerned 
or worried or grieved over any saint or believer in this church. If I knew you were on your knees searching yourself before the Holy Ghost, you would come to the church purged and clean, not by my preaching, not by Brother Carter Conlon's preaching, or any else, anybody else in this pulpit, you would have already been purged by the Holy Ghost in the secret closet. You would come here free and clear, and we could start preaching to sinners. And I'm telling you, when we get to that place, God will release the pastors to preach to sinners. He's cleaning up his church right now. He's trying to turn the searchlight onto our hearts. And when he's done with that, when he's got a people, when he has a people who will go alone and shut themselves in, I mean every day. Search me, O oh God. David said, try me. See if there be any wicked way in me. Search me. Oh, he'll tell you. But then you've got to act on it. And if you won't act on it, he's not going to tell you anything else until you act on that first. But if you act on it, not only does he tell you, he helps you deal with it. He gives you the wisdom the courage, he comes and empowers you to obey his will. Hallelujah. Very simple. I want the word to be a flame in my heart. I want to really believe it. And I want to live by it. <clears throat> I want to live by it. I don't want to teach by it. I want the word so inflamed in me that I, I can teach I can speak the word and I know it's the heart of God. And secondly, I'm going to search my heart so that there's nothing in me that's unlike my Jesus. If I do that, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. I can say with Paul, I'm ready to be offered. Hallelujah. Then no darkness can blind your eyes. No deception can deceive you. No false prophet. Nobody can get to your spirit because you have been led by the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Will you stand? Folks, let me tell you something about this church. This church is going into revival. God's moving us on. It's going to be this altar. This past Tuesday, the altars were so crowded, went all the way back both sides across the back. The Holy Spirit came with such power and conviction. God's been speaking to me more and more recently about preaching evangelistic. And I think it's because he's about to bring in sinners on all sides. And he's going to save and save and save. But tell you what he's going to have. He's going to have a, a body of people so searched, so in love with the word, and nothing can move them. And they're ready to teach all these that are coming in. My, of all you that stood, what a, what a, a wonderful host of people that can teach these new converts that are going to be coming in. We've had more people saved in the past couple months than we've had in the history of the church. And yet, folks, that's just the beginning. That's just the beginning. Folks, we're not just for crowds. We're not just looking for Christ. We're not looking for numbers. We want to see God move in the city. We want to see your family saved. If you've got unsaved husband, wife, relatives, we want to see them saved. We want to see Jesus bring them to the place. And folks, when that comes, uh, you know, the Lord, the Lord doesn't keep reproving once there's obedience. He moves right on and, and he gathers up his children with grace and love and joy and says, now I want to use you. God wants to purge us to use us. That's his whole purpose. Hallelujah. Lord, I pray tonight that, that you will speak into the hearts of so many that are here. As they walk out of this building tonight, as they go to their cars or the subway or bus, 
as they go home, Holy Spirit, keep this ringing in their ears. You ought to be a teacher by now. You ought to be a teacher by now. Teach my word. Learn it. Teach it. Let it be on fire. Search your heart. See if there be any wicked way. And Lord, then we'll be prepared as a bride. We will be prepared as a bride. The bride prepared herself. Lord, let us prepare ourselves now for what is coming. And Lord, if we'll do this, we'll be ready for the riots. We'll be ready for the fires. We'll be ready for explosions. We'll be ready for anything. We'll be ready to lay our lives down, Jesus, because nobody can rob us of that hope that we have in you. Lord, if it's instant death, it's instant glory. It's instant glory. So we have need, no need to fear. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. This is the conclusion of the message.